Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, since since we've uh, made a prompt start, I thought uh, perhaps the best thing to do would be to uh, give you two short pieces um, to break up the time. Um, the first on art and the second on the turn to language. Uh, I take it that analytical psychology is a movement of expressive religious humanism and in common with a good deal of the thought that's flowed from German idealism. It sees our life as transacted in symbols. It sees creativity as, so to say, coming up from within. It, it internalizes, and there's a shift, uh, as it were, from um, an objectively established pre-existent world order to an emphasis on the subject and the symbols the subject lives by, and so to say, generating. Uh, the world in which in which we live. Um, well, for the first piece, which will be fairly short, I, I'm, I want to compare the change I see as taking place in religious thought with that which took place in painting um, around the turn of the century. Uh, that's what I had in mind originally to give you. In fact, I'm going to abridge it, because then in the uh, second half of this session, I'd like to ask whether... Jungian psychology can make the linguistic turn in the same sort of way that Freudian did in France in the 50s and 60s with the Lacanians and so on, um, whether the, the turn to language isn't something now called for in, in Jungian thought. But the first little piece is about uh, uh, the shift away from realism in painting and it draws an analogy between that and what's now, I think, happening in religion as well. So I, I imagine the major themes of this will be pretty familiar to you and, I hope, uh, congenial. Although there's now some dispute about its precise date, maybe 1910, maybe 1913, the abstract watercolour improvisation by Vasily Kandinsky has long been regarded as the first wholly non-realistic or non-representational painting in Western art. In connection with this momentous event, Kandinsky himself tells the following story, dating the incident in the year 1908. It was twilight. I was returning immersed in thought from my sketching when, on opening the studio door, I was suddenly confronted by a picture of indescribable and incandescent loveliness. Bewildered, I stopped, staring at it. The painting lacked all subject, depicted no identifiable object, and was entirely composed of bright colour patches. Finally, I approached closer, and only then recognised it for what it really was, my own painting standing on its side on the easel. The following day, by daylight, I tried to recapture the impression I'd experienced the day before, but I couldn't do so entirely. The story's a very good one, even though anyone habituated to biblical criticism and therefore having an evil, suspicious mind will smile and recognise that here's a tale that's been told many times by a man intent on building up a myth. The odd combination of twilight with the incandescence and bright colour of the painting and the equally dubious claim to remember a state of being immersed in thought show us that what Kandinsky is doing is setting the scene for a moment of revelation. To confirm this, there's a doublet, for Kandinsky has a second and earlier story of how he first saw a painting as an abstract. It dates from 1895, when he saw one of Monet's Haystack series at an exhibition in Moscow. It was the catalogue that taught me that I was looking at a haystack. I was incapable of recognising it. I confusedly felt that an object was lacking in the painting. Yet, although Monet's work was almost non-figurative and could be seen as being wholly so, it proved to be extraordinarily memorable. Kandinsky says, at the most unexpected moments one saw it float before one's eyes with its slightest details. This story also has a religious flavour, for it leads to a vocation. Kandinsky used to tell it to explain why he'd chosen to become a painter. Like such contemporaries as Malevich and Mondrian, Kandinsky was articulate about the reasons why the move to non-realism had been made. Precedents had been found in the tradition. 
For example, in those passages in paintings by Delacroix, which had so impressed Seurat. Passages which, when viewed close up, dissolved into splashes and brief strokes of brilliant colour. The rise of a new commercial and industrial middle-class society, in which art no longer had its old public function, had forced painting to become critically self-conscious. It turned back to examine itself and its own techniques, even though in so doing it perforce ran the risk of alienating and bewildering the public. It had to do so, because the rise of mechanical ways of recording nature, science in general and the camera in particular, had called into question the traditional assumption that a work of art gets its value and its justification from the way it signifies something else that stands beyond itself. Kandinsky saw German idealist philosophy, and above all music, as suggesting the possibility of an alternative, non-mimetic and purely expressive artistic practice. He strove to create a form of painting in which, as he said in 1912, line would be free of the obligation to designate a thing in a painting and would itself function as a thing. The painting would no longer be a mere copy. It would be seen as standing alone and not having to pretend anymore to be anything other than itself. Even more important to the first non-figurative painters was the revolution in physics, which seemed to show that a centuries-old construction of the world, going back to the Florentine Renaissance and the scientific revolution, was not, after all, cons constitutive of reality, but had merely been imposed upon reality by the human mind. For centuries, the painter's eye had looked upon something like a Newtonian world, with masses disposed in Euclidean space. The composition of a traditional painting, with its heavy bottom reflecting the Earth's gravitational pull, with its up and down and left and right, with its framed and balanced vision, was based on a worldview which was no longer seen as being objective and compulsory, but as human and optional. Painting was now free to break out of that order. Incidentally, of course, at that time, people are also beginning to discover um, schools of painting in China and Japan and India and so on, which don't work by Western perspective. So the, the possibility of other ways of seeing the world and the, so to say, merely cultural character of our own way of seeing the world was being realised in that way as well. Painting, then, was now free to break out of the Newtonian construction of the world, break out of the imperative to copy the Newtonian world picture. This is the significance of the floating of Monet's picture and of the fact that Kandinsky's own painting lay on its side. A painting seen topside up is locked into our normal cosmological vision. When it's turned on its side and seen afresh, it's broken out of that vision and stands alone in a moment of revelation. At first, the break with realism and the move to a non-representational art appeared to be a revolutionary change, as if all painting hitherto had suddenly been found to be worthless because it rested on a mistaken theory. But this sense of discontinuity was only temporary. Many of the abstract artists themselves thought rather in terms of continuity, and in time art history was rewritten to demonstrate that continuity. What is more, not all art was instantly obliged to become abstract expressionist. Realism continued, and in later generations might even be revived, though with the proviso that abstract art had made a permanent and valuable difference to the way we see all art. Neo-realism cannot be quite the same thing as realism was in the old days before the move to abstraction had been made. Well, by now, the point to which this elaborate metaphor is leading must be becoming increasingly obvious. But one more detail may be added. Confronting abstract art, some people suspect that they may be the victims of a confidence trick. They feel that an art not humbled and disciplined by the task of representing an object truthfully must become arbitrary. It refuses to bow to objective standards by which it can be tested. 
It is egoistic, arrogant, self-indulgent and insincere. To which it may be replied that the new kind of art is in practice found to impose very severe standards and to demand purity of heart and motive more stringently than ever. Where there is a sitter and a need to please him, there are many temptations to flattery, evasion and deceit. But where the artist is alone, and his work is nothing but an expression of and a terrible judgment upon himself, the commitment to his art required of him becomes unconditional. More than ever, there's something hidden that she or he must be true to, something that has the qualities of eternity, absoluteness, and inescapability about it. We leave it at that and suggest that religious thought today stands where painting stood in 1910 or so. It's becoming non-representational. A long history has brought us to the point where the representationalist model of what we're doing in our religious worship and faith and practice no longer satisfies us. Resting as it does on an obsolete metaphysics, realist religion is bad religion in the same way as James Tissot's paintings are bad art, and a religious imperative drives us to challenge it. One factor in this has been the rise of a new kind of society, in which religion doesn't have the same public function as formerly, and a, and a new self-criticism, to which religious thought has therefore been led. Another has been the rise of powerful alternative methods of representing reality, in particular science. But at a deeper level, there's been the realization, stemming from German idealist philosophy, that all systems of representation, whether scientific or religious, are merely human conventions, with a limited span of useful life, a realization that undermined the very concept of representation itself. The very notion that either science or art or religion get their justification from their simple accuracy in registering, copying and responding to objective and independent structures out there has broken down. The point we make is general applying equally to science, art and religious belief. The idea of copying has broken down because we can never get into a position in which we can set the copy and the pure original side by side for comparison. We see many kinds of copy, but we never see any original just as it is, an objective, mind-independent, real structure out there, fully independent of our systems of representation. We see things only in representation, and never absolutely. We can compare the way things look under different points of view or perspectives, but we do not have any absolute or perspective-less perspective vision of things that we can use as a standard for testing the accuracy of the various perspectival visions. Their justification must become simply pragmatic. Nietzsche was a philosophical perspectivist who suggested that every philosopher's system and vision of the world was a disguised and projected spiritual autobiography. The move to abstraction in painting reflected this idea, art becoming a creative expression of the artist's own subjectivity. In the process, the standards to which the artist had to work were internalised, what counted now was not the external accuracy of the copying relation, but inner honesty, truthfulness, sincerity and fidelity to the artistic vocation. Art for art's sake, autonomous art, could be and was ridiculed as elitist and self-indulgent, and the same criticisms have been levelled more recently against the idea of the autonomy of religion. But many or most people are today ready to acknowledge that abstract art is after all real art, that it does impose its own very strict spiritual discipline, and that in any case we've now reached a point where we no longer feel the need to draw any sharp distinction between abstract and figurative works. We're ready to acknowledge 
that the inner imperatives to which the abstract artist found herself subject, and which she felt so powerfully, apply to all artists alike. Figurative and non-figurative art come to be judged by the same standards. This being conceded, then we may be ready to allow that abstract art has made a dent in the way we see all art, and to recognise why it is that music is at once the least figurative, most purely expressive, and the closest to religion of all art forms. And now, after all this, we may be free to revive various sorts of realism as the spirit moves us, but it'll be realism after abstraction, realism with a difference. And so it is with religion. Well, I think I'll um, end that first little piece there. Uh, I hope the uh, uh, point I'm trying to make uh, is, is a familiar one and a congenial one to Jungians. Um, the imperatives move within. Whereas in traditional propositional religious beliefs, the imperatives were pictured as externally or heteronymously imposed by an objective God, when religions fully internalized, the imperatives are seen as inner, inward, uh, in the same sort of way as, as happened in art. Uh, perhaps a traditionalist in painting uh, measured uh, a picture by whether it was said to say true to life by its uh, uh, submission to external uh, canons of what constitutes a good copying. Uh, but after the move to non-realism, after the move to abstraction, uh, we assess paintings a different way. We no longer expect them, so to say, just to be good copies in the mechanical sort of way that a photograph may be. Uh, we expect a painting to show us something about the, the spiritual quality of the person who produced it to have the, the character of a symbol uh, that may affect our psyches in, in some sort of way that uh, uh, is analogous to uh, the way it's affected the, the artist who made it. Um, so there, for that first uh, session, uh, uh, first uh, short piece then, um, I, I, I wanted to suggest that um, the growth to adulthood in religion that's required of us now, the movement from heteronomy to autonomy, very familiar in morality, uh, but also is, is paralleled in, in, in the development of Western art. Um, and I think in, in Jung himself, though he had no uh, special knowledge of, of what was going on in painting his time, uh, you can see many of these themes appearing. Well, perhaps uh, people may wish to take up or comment on or criticise as that, uh, so as to give you a break from listening to me. A word in my mind was Hieronymy or Hieronymus Bosch and his fantasy mm. creatures, which seem to be somewhere in between the copying of Mm. external reality and the <coughs> symbol in an abstract form. That's right. Um, you himself, of course, said that uh, it was different in the Middle Ages, as it were, yeah. that medieval religious art uh, hadn't made the same sort of sharp distinction between the inner and outer worlds that came to be made after the scientific revolution. The effect of the scientific revolution was, so to say, to devalue the external world and, and so make a rather sharp distinction between the, the outer world and the inner. But uh, medieval religious art, Jung uh, greatly admired because uh, it, it fully unified the inner world and the outer. Yes, and, and that tradition persisted, of course, in the, in the Netherlands well after um, the Florentine Renaissance. Yes. But yeah, I, I liked your. Uh, verbal association between heteronomy and, uh, and uh, hieronymus Jerome. <laughs> it's a nice, nice association. Could I say yes. I think the copying aspect yeah. is perhaps really um, because there was no technique for copying. Yeah. Um, and uh, really, this painting and art never really had anything to do with copying at 
control, no. which has seemed to have to do with it, because now we have cameras, so maybe that kind of um, technology can exist. Because I think that the copying aspect is, is very, very minimal. I think that uh, the art has always been to do with um, abstraction. Yeah, but his thought copying was important in Florence well, so and uh, Florence onwards. The use of the string frame and of mirrors and the camera oscura and similar devices yeah, as aids, technical aids in the production well, of paintings, of course, suggested that the painter tried to put on his canvas the same thing as was on his retina, as it were. Yes. And he saw he saw visual perception as as the imprinting of a picture on the retina which the optic nerve then somehow copied to the soul, um, as it were. So that the idea of copying became important at any rate between the, say, the 16th and 19th centuries, but it was an aberration, um, no doubt. Well, I don't know whether it's an aberration. I think it's probably necessary. Yeah. And I think it was recognized as being necessary. Yeah. But I think that the, the motivation of art is always... Yeah, expressive. Of course. Yes, yes. yes. And of the soul. Yes. Expressive yes. of the soul. Yes. And the discipline actually always has basically been uh, the interaction of the, of the artistically gifted person with their materials. I mean, I think there's a, an enormous humility of any artist in the face of his materials because he's it, never ever put himself above or greater than Yes. 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 Yes, I think, I, that, think it's always been I, I think that's right, but perhaps only <laughs> um, after the revolution that occurred in the Paris school between about 1880 and 1915 or so, only after that could, could was, it, was it possible to say what you just said, as it were, that, that there needed to be a break with the, so to say, idolatry of Newtonianism and copying, as it were. You needed to, you needed to relativize that and, and say that's the, uh, and distance yourself a bit from it in order to be able to see art as expressive. I don't think that that's sort of fairly young in the history of our art. I mean, yes. art is such an old, old thing, isn't it? I mean, yes. I think of cave paintings as well. Yes. I mean, that, that is far more um, yes. uh, nearly connected, actually, than, than the curiosity of world <laughs> Yes, yes, um, yes. Yes, no, I suppose I was simply comparing the, um, the outraged public reaction to avant-garde painting between but impressionism and abstraction yes. this is, this with the similar similarity. horror of any sort of comparable analogous modernization of religious belief today. You've got the yes, same kind of problem yes. of trying to break away from, from literalism in both cases that, that you, you have to try to loose people's minds from the grip of literalism uh, uh, in both cases and, and it's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody was describing to me the other day, David Jenkins, at a, uh, at a, at a talking at a, to a sixth form at a school, and he was trying to explain what he meant about the resurrection, and he was saying, don't just think of the resurrection as a kind of science fiction miracle that occurred one Sunday morning in the year 33. Try to think of it the way St. Paul does, as a kind of deep inner transformation of yourself and a change over from egoism to egolessness and think of this as a kind of communal thing, a search for a less uh, uh, ruthlessly selfish uh, psyche and a way of life. And try to think of the resurrection in terms of, of uh, something that must happen to you and within you. And they all said, oh, so you don't believe in the resurrection? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what the whole British public says, you see. I mean, I've gone through this a hundred times on, on you know, radio phone and that kind of thing. Any attempt to, uh, as it were, bring religious belief existentially to life in people's experience is regarded as disbelief. <laughs> and that's, I think, uh, why someone like me as a theologian regards the, uh, uh, as it were, the break with realism or literalism is, is a very important one to make. Uh, so, so we, we find that it is so very uh, strongly ingrained in people's thinking. Again, Jung, I suppose, would say that uh, uh, people find it more comfortable and safer to hold religious beliefs in a, an objectified, li literalistic way because that reduces their inner challenge. It makes them less disturbing. You, you feel you're one of the orthodox without ever having to grapple at a very deep level with what religious beliefs are saying to you. Um, 
So I think Jung would see uh, this extreme objectification and, and, and literalism in religious dogma as a, as a kind of defense thing. Sorry, somebody else would say something. I interrupted. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yes, now that I do want to, I want to get away from because, because indeed, I don't, uh, I don't want to take the view that the abstract impressionist just finds a way of objectifying his psyche. So when we look at a work of art, what we're really doing is, is using it as a medium for encountering the soul of the artist, as it were, because that's to make the work of art again only a sort of copy or representation. It's rather that. Um, our spiritual development actually takes place through our symbolic expression, our, uh, our ability to express and articulate ourselves. Um, you need actually to do it, so to say. Um, so the, the, the production of the work of art actually accomplishes the spiritual movement and development. You don't know what you think till you've tried to write it down, <laughs> because the writing down is the thinking almost. Um, uh, yes, um, Yes, I, I see what you mean. And um, in literary criticism, this is called intentionalism. The true meaning of a poem is what the artist intended to express when, when writing the poem, so to say. So you try to get, go through the poem to discover something about the soul of the poet on the far side of it, as it were. And, uh, of course, modern poets strongly resist that idea and that want to concentrate our attention on the movement of words in the text of the poem. I've got a colleague at the college who is a, a major poet, probably, uh, and he gets streams of letters from people who want to come and use up his time by asking him about what his poems mean, as if he were an authority, as it were. And I think, like most poets, he says, well, the poem's just an arrangement of symbols on a printed page. It's as close to you as it is to me. Um, reading is creative interpretation um, you've got to do the reading as it were, I can't do it for you you'd want to say um, so that uh, once the poem's made it's a public object and is distanced from the poet who wrote it he's in a sense died, he's disappeared, he's vanished he's no longer there the poem is a public object and it's available for anybody to read so you shouldn't come to me supposing that I'm, as it were, an expert, as if it were just a code. Uh, now, I agree. I think in the second piece, when I talk about the turn to language, uh, uh, I'll be trying to meet the point you've just made, that we, we shouldn't suppose that the, the art product or the, the faith or whatever is itself a copy of something sort of psychic or spiritual on the far side of it. The, the symbols themselves, we've got to look at the symbols themselves and how they work and move, because they're available, they're public, they're manifest, they're for us yes, to read. Yes, I, I think I'm trying to express that, the mm. expressive yeah. expressing yeah. the yeah. yeah. uh, Yes. Yes. Mm. Well, I think it lies outside the individual in the same sort of way as language does. Yes, yes. That uh, the very possibility of language implies that culture is a is a system of signs. Uh, that existed before we came on the scene and will continue to exist after we came on the scene and it's in ceaseless living movement and the, the work of art <coughs> flows into that and is part of it. Um, I, I'd be wary about going further than that. Um, incidentally, just on that point, 
on the driving here on the way, I was thinking about Freud's famous paper, Analysis Terminal, Terminable and Interminable, and the suggestion that psychoanalysis and um, analytical psychology were pioneers of, of hermeneutical theory. They saw our life as transacted in symbols, and a modern science of interpretation will be a kind of hermeneutic. It'll see our life as, as, so to say, an endless reinterpretation of symbols. And that's what's going on in analysis. Um, and because you never come to the end of a symbol system, there never is any uh, point at which uh, the symbols cease to refer to anything else, but you, you've reached a kind of final revelation. The, the process is interminable. It goes on forever as it were. Um, and art, in that way, too, is, um, is not progressive. It goes on forever. One of the differences between art and science is that many scientists still hold the view that they're getting, so to say, that science is progressive, that they're getting steadily closer to the truth, a fully adequate representation of how things are in the world. Whereas in art, we don't expect there to be that kind of progress. Nobody produces a work of art which makes all further art unnecessary, or, as it were. Art doesn't come to an end. Um, and um, perhaps uh, if, if with the German idealists we do see art as the central and typical human activity, um, then the way we see religion and philosophy and science will be will be affected by that. We'll see these as symbolic activities in which um, um, uh, which are endless, which just go on, um, and we'll give up the idea of a, of a kind of a final revelation of absolute truth that 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 enables us to pass beyond the symbolic level entirely. Um, but you may ha you may have views about that uh, about so to say whether whether the movement is from sign to thing signified that ultimately you escape from symbols or whether the movement is always sideways from sign to sign so that uh, um, the movement of symbols goes on forever. <laughs> I think Plato, for example, and that rationalist tradition said in the long run you transcend symbols. In the long run, you reach a pure intellectual vision which is beyond symbolism. I think the implication of, of psychoanalysis and all that's come from it is that uh, the movement from one symbol to another goes on forever and that that's how human life should be understood. Yes, 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 that's right, yes. If you see the symbol merely as a sort of dirty window pane, and people sometimes say this about icons or about stained glass windows or something, the thing is meant to be a sort of window pane. You kind of look through it to something else on the far side of it. Um, whereas in postmodern thought, particularly, that's denied. I and mean, the, the defining characteristic of postmodern thought, really, is that it rejects a transcendent transcendent signified. It rejects the idea of going beyond the symbol to something else, as it were. It accepts that human life is lived entirely within symbols. That's, uh, indeed, that's, that's what human life is. So it's culture, it's symbol. Um, yeah. Isn't the new kind of <laughs> well, not quite, because it's, it's endless or unbounded. Um, whereas I imagine fundamentalism attempts a kind of closure or Mm. I, mean, I started off with thinking that the early painters thought that they conveyed the spirit of one person to another person's soul through the psyche, through the, through yeah. the vision of this painting. And that one couldn't have explained to them and said mm. what mm. we can now say because we've had photography. Mm. Mm. Um, and I was wondering what right one had to say to fundamentalists, mm. you've got it wrong, mm. if that's where they were. I mean, I can see that you're arguing, well, they attack me, so I've got to say something back. <laughs> but, um, 
But isn't the position that you were now in something like this? I'm not quite clear why. Um, and uh, as for the... What you're saying is yeah. itself, nothing else. We look at that. That's what we did for you. If we say I want to look beyond that. Would that be the statement? Uh, no, it's, it's a set of difference between seeing Freud and Jung as scientists who are proposing sort of descriptive, constitutively true scientific theories about the makeup of the human personality, or seeing them as interpreters, as fundamentally literary figures, really, and, and sages, who show us a way of interpreting our lives, which is not, doesn't aim to be rigorously systematic in, in the way that some people thought science is, but which, uh, which so to say, goes on, has a certain endlessness about it. Um, so it's, you see, we've, we've been, had a long late history of positivism in, in this country, which has tended to uh, ridicule uh, Freud and Jung and say, if you apply orthodox scientific method testing, which you find it very difficult to test, or if, if, if you do find a way of testing them empirically, the results are very ambiguous. Um, but I think I'd want to say that misses the point, actually. Although these two great figures use um, uh, a scientific language, in fact, they're interpreters, and the kind of interpreting they're doing is, is uh, more like literary, literature or art, than it is like the sound. Um, yeah. Is something trying to say something on that? Yeah. I was simply, that, uh, I was trying to refer what, what you had been saying, comparing it with Jung. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there is a fundamental difference that Jung pretty consistently is said, uh, uh, fairly consistently said, that um, he saw the symbols as um, um, but you would not say that there was no transcendent, uh, yeah. nothing transcendent yeah. uh, He reserved his position. I agree yeah. with yeah. right. That's right, yes. Uh, on Kantian grounds, really, that yes. uh, all we've got is representation. But he is agnostic about that's right. What is uh, it? Yes, and he, he, so to say, deals with the religious beliefs in terms of their psychological truth and the way, the way they, as it were, work in our lives. Yes. And, and simply reserves his position or is agnostic about uh, But this is, this is analogous with the medieval thought that says that we know God only through his effects or we know God only through symbols and analogies. Yes. We don't know God as he is in himself, as it were. And, um, yeah. Especially for the mystics. Yeah, Especially with mystics. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. It's a so that, yes. So that ultimately, you you have to get beyond knowledge, as it were. Yes. But I don't know that that's a very different from my position. But yes, we've got to. Well, it seems to me there's another pole to that. Yeah. The the symbol and Jung's reservation about the, what is actually transcendent mm. is the other the mirror image of that is that the symbol is it's where it links into the body. The yeah. symbol as the portrait of the instinct, in yes. which just gives something more tangible to this feeling of the symbol going on forever. Mm. One never yeah. being able to yes. it. Because Jung, it was so important to him that that link between whatever is transcendent, the symbol, and the body, so it's all yeah. brought into the body. Yes. And symbols of <coughs> marriage or of having a child have immediate experience when they're actually incarnate. Yes. Uh, and the symbol then seems to go on towards something else. Yes. That's right. Life. Yes. Well, I think uh, I might now turn to this second piece because it is it is very much on that point. Yes, it uh, on the the turn to language. Um, yes. Um, how are we for time? Well, I've um, right. got a, another little piece here about about the linguistic turn. Um, as you know, in in the uh, Colf Bodien, um, at such places in in Paris in the 50s and 60s, Lacan and others turned psychoanalytical theory in a linguistic direction, and uh, that suggested to me that um, the kind of 
expressive Christian humanism that I'd like to articulate, and perhaps the uh, the kind of psychological theory that you're dealing with um, has needs to consider the implications of, of the terms of language and our modern awareness of, of language. Um, and although in, in this the, these first few thoughts, this is a, only a barest beginning, at any rate, it raises some of the questions, um, and, and I hope may interest you. It's called the dictionary. Look up a word in the dictionary. There you find that its origin, its history, and its various uses and meanings are all explained in terms of other words. Some of these may be unfamiliar to you, so you go on to look them up as well. And soon you find yourself browsing, wandering back and forth through the book indefinitely. One word leads to another, and so on forever. The dictionary is, uh, or is like, the infinite book of sand described in a Borges story. It has no beginning because a one-language dictionary presumes that you were already within the language that it explains. You cannot consult the book at all unless you're already part of its world. The book is a tool for sharpening up your awareness of the nuances in a field of differential relationships between words, a field in which you already stand. And this field is endless or unbounded like the surface of a sphere, for there is no last word in the dictionary that doesn't lead straight back to others. The dictionary's world is self-contained. You may think these observations very banal, but the fact is that they've come to strike people really forcibly only in relatively modern times. Earlier, these features of language were often overlooked because people made two deep assumptions. They assumed that there was a pre-established and guaranteed harmony between thought and being, and they assumed that our words, especially our spoken words, give immediate expression to our thoughts. So thoughts naturally copy things, and language was our medium of communication, the means whereby we publicize and share our thoughts about things. Language was a medium, but it was a transparent medium. It was unproblematic and could therefore be disregarded. Writing was a decontextualized and therefore relatively imperfect record of the spoken word. But speech itself directly and naturally expresses thought, which equally naturally copies things. No problem. Words just name things. These assumptions were encouraged by people's ethnocentrism. They tended to take seriously only one language, one culture and view of the world, namely their own. The implications of the fact that different cultures construe the world differently were scarcely perceived before modern times. Earlier, it was assumed that we talk sense and our language grasps reality as it is. And as for foreigners, they haven't got a proper grip on things. They are barbaro fonoi, people who say bar bar instead of talking sense. Hence the word barbarian. People who say bar bar are non greek and also the link between the words Babel, Babylon and Babel, which makes the unkind Hebrew pun behind the story of the Tower of Babel translate so directly into English. As a result, people in traditional cultures thought of their gods and spirits as addressing them in their own language. Nobody in the Hebrew Bible expresses astonishment that God should turn up to speak classical Hebrew. Of course he does. For if he is a language user, and his language first formed the world, and if our language perfectly grasps our world, then clearly our language must be his, and his ours. He is the only God, and only we know him, ergo only we talk sense. We talk sense and grasp the world, so the world maker's language must be our language. Nor were people entirely wrong to think in this way, for our language is indeed our world. As the dictionary reminded us, there can be no one-word language, and no word stands alone, having its meaning all by itself. Meaning is never self-same, and always differential. Every word as such is part of a system. Human languages are cultural, historical products, and a people's communication is what they are. It is their cultural identity and their view of the world. It is their grip on reality. We do make a few 
pre-linguistic and universal sounds, in particular the basic cries of the flesh. These include the baby's contented singing to itself, catches of the breath, gasps, grunts, groans, hisses, belches, cries, shrieks, screams, and the death rattle. There are also the hunter's imitations of, natural so of animal sounds. But the other seeming exceptions, though many, are all in fact related to particular languages. There are instances of a fascinating paradox that when you break the rules of a language, you don't step right outside it, for it remains that language and not another whose rules you're breaking. English nonsense is still English nonsense and differs from French nonsense. W work chants, war whoops, sweet nothings, delirium and glossolalia are all, at least, as at least phonotactically, associated with one language rather than another. And although outside the rules, they're not meaningless, for they can be interpreted. So even when you break the rules of language, you're still in the language. It's a fascinating, extraordinary thought. At the opposite extreme, there are some very specialised areas of language which are tightly rule-governed in the manner of a communication code. They include the drill sergeant's commands on the barrack square and the exclamations that are made during the playing of certain games. Here, the code precedes the message. Rules laid down beforehand have prescribed every message that can be given within the code. The drill sergeant cannot innovate. If the squad are standing at ease, there are only two messages he can emit. Attention and stand easy. And if he's not said the one, then he must have said the other. Semiotic structuralism was a movement which sought to explain our natural languages on the analogy of such communication codes. Yet there was an obvious difficulty. It made the origin of language inconceivable. How could people ever have framed and agreed the rules which first made language possible? And in any case, our ordinary language is much more flexible than a communication code, and has to be so in order to permit historical change. An act of innovative rule-breaking in language, such as the coining of a new metaphor, is rather like a mutation in genetics. If it catches on and proves adaptive, then it helps the whole language organism to evolve. The point of my own metaphor here being that genes do not operate singly, but as elements within complex systems, and a change in just one gene can have widespread effects. Similarly, there have been cases where an outstandingly powerful new metaphor has influenced a whole culture. And as in genetics, so in language, what is needed is both a rule-governed system and the possibility of innovation. As we've noted, the meaning of a word is not self-same, atomic and referential, but differential, a function of its relation to other words. It follows that the movement of thought is not from words directly onto things and then from thing to thing, but from sign to sign. The American philosopher C.S. Peirce was the first to state the essential point clearly. All thought is transacted in signs, and every sign by its nature leads on to another sign that interprets it by taking it up, developing it, countering it, or whatever. And in this way, every sign is in principle capable of opening up an endless series of further signs that continue the conversation or the movement of thought indefinitely. So we keep arriving from different angles at the same doctrine. Because a sign stands for, every sign leads to another and so on forever. Because meaning is not self-same but differential, every meaning opens up an endless chain of relations to other meanings. Because words exist only in languages, every word is a loosely held position in a great system of evolving relativities. At this point I must briefly introduce the concept of a scale. Perhaps the oldest use of language is directly to influence other people's behaviour. So consider for a moment the vocabulary available to us for setting out to do this. It's very large, but some at least of the main terms are these. I beg, beseech, implore, entreat, solicit, invite, request, ask, call upon, bid, summon, demand, insist, order, command, decree, and so on. 
Every English speaker will at once recognize that here is a scale of 16 degrees of increasingly strong language. And will feel with me that requesting is a shade stronger than inviting and a shade weaker than asking or calling upon someone to do something. It's clear what's happening here. In every differentiated society, there's a scale of degrees of power and entitlement. Society impresses this scale most effectively on all its members. Cooperation is highly important, but we'll not succeed in gaining it unless we're sensitive to our place in the pecking order and choose our words with care. We have to get the level of linguistic pressure that we exert just right. By so doing, we gratify our auditor, confirm social rankings, and make a good claim to be heard by the very way in which our use of the correct form shows that we belong to the same moral community as the one we address. A complication appears as we consider our example, for there's evidently more than one scale at work in it. As well as the scale of degrees of power, there's also a related but distinct scale of degrees of right or entitlement. Thus, when I ask a woman to marry me, social convention decrees that the language of entreaty shall be used. By contrast, if conventionally established right is on my side, I may use the language of claim or even demand when I tackle even a person very much more powerful than myself. Now we have the beginnings of a theory of language. We need to cooperate, and in order to secure cooperation, by which I mean any and every mutual adjustment of behavior, we must communicate. Our ability to communicate effectively depends upon our prior communal development of a large number of agreed scales, each of a broadly evaluative kind. These are imprinted upon each of us in such a way that in any given situation we feel emotionally which scales are relevant and to what position on each of them the situation should be assigned. Forms of words are acquired, well-tried behavioural responses to situations thus assessed. A word's meaning is its assignment to an approximate relative position on some scale or combination of scales, or grid. Feeling how things are, we get the measure of the situation and know which words are apt. Social training has accomplished this marvel. It has differentiated our bodily feelings, ordered them on complex evaluative scales and grids, and correlated them with appropriate linguistic forms. Here we have a glimpse of the historic function of God and of the religious realm generally. By being in so many respects maximally exalted over us, God generated many of the key scales and impressed them upon us. He headed the scales that ran from the heights to the depths, from order to chaos, from power to weakness, from good to evil, from holiness to abomination. He made these and other scales long. He connected them, and he made them cosmic, and thus he created the world of linguistic meaning. Language was most rich and complex, and words had to be chosen with the greatest care and sensitivity, precisely when you had dealings with God. Religion was the nursery of differentiation. Along these lines, then, we may begin to see the differentiation of our bodily feelings, of language, and of social relations as all proceeding in parallel. And we may come to see all human activities as communicative and symbolic. In dreams and dress, meals and work, music and mathematics, play and bodily comportment, we are all the time making symbolic statements, communicating with each other and adjusting to each other. And because meaning is reducible to physically felt positions on evaluative scales and grids, we can resolve the ancient polarity between expression and cognition. To anticipate a formula that I must prove later, through language, the expression of the body is the cognition of the world. It was during the 19th century the people began to study our human languages as complex natural objects with histories and evolutionary relationships. Like other rising new sciences, linguistics sought autonomy for itself. And as our experiment with the dictionary indicated, 
you don't need to go outside language in order to explain language. You are always already within it and must therefore explain it from within. Linguistics could thus as readily become naturalistic in outlook as any other science. More so indeed, for language is in the unique position of being perhaps able to explain itself entirely in terms of itself, whereas all the other sciences have to be constructed in language understood in a broad sense to include technical terms, mathematics and so on. Thus it begins to look as if the theory of signs and communication, all the devices that we've socially evolved to coordinate our common life, may turn out to be the true super science. It provides a general matrix on which all the various specialized skills, skills and branches of knowledge can be plotted. Here's the possibility, then, of a new starting point for philosophy. In the past, it started from whatever seemed the solidest foundation to build on. From being, from matter, from a priori truths of reason, from experience, or whatever. But perhaps the true universal stuff, in and of which everything else is constructed, is the sign and communication. For every aspect of what we call reality is established in and by language. Obvious though this suggestion is, there's no doubt that it antagonises people and that the phrase linguistic idealism is something of a red rag to a bull. Nevertheless, the essential thesis is quickly reached, even from a classical empiricist starting point. For suppose two people look up at the night sky. One sees a black velvet canopy with tiny holes in it through which the light of heaven shines. The other sees great burning bodies, the stars, in empty space. OK, says the empiricist, so they have different theories and interpret the data differently, but their sense perceptions are the same. Yet what are these perceptions? Twinkles on a black field? Even on the empiricist view, there is no objectivity and nothing is there until the spectator has interpreted what she's seen in terms of a theory and has expressed herself in language, so objectivity enters only with language. And what of the supposed uninterpreted perceptions? Whether we describe them as twinkles on a black field or as scattered points of stimulation on the retina, we can't spell out what they are, except by reference to further theories. We go on peeling the onion in search of that pure datum of uh, objectivity at the centre, and we miss the point that objectivity is given with the whole onion. Objectivity is given in and with language, it is not, as realists suppose, something external to language around which language wraps itself. However, if we do reconstruct philosophy around the sign, language and communication, there's no doubt that it'll come to have a very different shape. We'll come to think of truth as made, not found. And we will reverse the traditional relations of art and nature, appearance and reality. In traditional Western thought, you aimed to get away from the manifest, <laughs> the immediately given, as soon as you could. You thought your salvation lay in moving to a higher, more enduring realm beyond it, by which you sought to be guided. So you tried to jump from appearance to reality, from the sign to the thing signified, from word to thing, from the sense impression to the real object which had caused it. Plato and others despised the world of sense and signs and feelings. It was secondary, subordinate and imperfect. Because it was a realm of constant and endless change and relativities, it seemed to Plato to scatter the soul and to make pitiable the condition of those caught up in it. Hypnotised, they gazed at a flickering painted veil that hid the truth from their eyes. They were trapped by illusions and needed to be rescued by force if necessary. Thus began a long history of vilification of all that is changing, differential and immediately present. Signs, feelings, the body. A history from whose legacy we are now trying to escape. For it is now necessary for philosophy to turn the world inside out. Instead of moving to a more real world beyond, in search of the ultimate grounds of knowledge and faith, meaning and value, they must now be derived directly from the immediacy of signs, feelings and the body. 
If Christian thought can accomplish this project, we may at last reach the integral Christian humanism which was promised from the first but hasn't yet been fully achieved. This great reversal, the shift from the older dogmatic realism towards the new creative and expressive religious humanism has been underway for some time. Darwin and Freud, not to mention Feuerbach and Marx, made it inevitable. We can see it coming about in phenomenology. Thus, Edmund Husserl says that we must reverse the order and regard the phenomenal thing that's directly presented in consciousness as being the real thing. As for the thing postulated as transcending our present and partial consciousness of it, it's a mere ideality, a thought object. The desire to begin from the life world and the here and now is even more marked in the later work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. The traditional dualism of subject and object, consciousness and things, thought and being, mind and matter, can be overcome by a philosophy that starts with the sign and communication. Merleau-Ponty thus became the first in France to say that modern linguistics, particularly Saussure's, called for philosophical development. Later he began to look for the production of meaning to the body and its expressive gestures. Now that the phrase body language has become part of the common currency, we may fail to notice how great a philosophical shift it has marked. Others, such as Nietzsche, Wittgenstein and Derrida, go further. For them, the surface play of phenomena, words, signs, meanings, appearances, is reality. Why seek to downgrade it? The fatal illusion is to believe that we can pierce the veil and find more real and unchanging verities beyond it. So Nietzsche calls for goodwill to appearance, meaning that we must renounce the poisonous habit of thinking ill of the manifest and contrasting it unfavourably with something better but invisible that we fancy lies on the far side of it. Wittgenstein asks us to give up dreams of transcendence and return to the life world to be content with seeing, in particular cases, what language is and how it works. Derrida criticises both Husserl's continuing desire for presence and immediacy and Heidegger's nostalgia for being, and is himself satisfied with secondariness. All our life is the continuation of tradition, process of creative reinterpretation and a movement from sign to sign in which we can conceive neither beginning nor end. Such is the strange power of philosophy that all these bewildering consequences flow from the extremely simple observation that we made at the beginning. Common sense assumes that words stand directly for things, that meaning is self-same, atomic and referential. The meaning of a word is just the thing it stands for. Words are nomina, names, nouns. However, Common sense is often a nest of questionable assumptions, and our glance at the dictionary was enough to expose this one. For the dictionary shows meaning to be relative and differential. A sign's meaning is given by its relations with neighbouring signs, as orange is that which pushes back red on one side and yellow on the other. The interpretative movement is not from sign directly onto thing signified, but sideways from sign to sign. From this, all else follows. It may therefore seem, as we suggested, that a general theory of signs and communication can now replace earlier starting points for philosophy, doing in our day the same sort of job as they did in theirs. Not quite. I go on to take it back, because uh, you can't actually have, uh, so to say, a dogmatic philosophy of language to, to replace older forms of philosophy. It's going to be more complicated and ambiguous than that. And I think it, why it's already appeared. But that's um, something I've just written, where I'm wondering about how a sort of creative and expressive humanism, which uh, in one way Jung was after, in another way I'm after, from a Christian point of view, how we can formulate that in a way that does justice to the modern concern with language. Um, as I suggested, um, Freudians in France 
uh, were grappling with this most impressively in the 50s and 60s. I'm not sure that Jungians have yet, or perhaps it's my own ignorance and you'll be able to put me right on that, but it seems to me that Jungian interpretation ought to find modern literary theory and uh, uh, theory of science uh, very congenial. So there ought to be a possibility there of a rapprochement, really, between Jungian thought and this rather trendy modern um, thought about the, um, about the sign. And uh, we need to do that if we're to present our um, religious humanism in a fully modern form. Well, any, any comment? It'll, it's just a, did I quote this earlier? Freud says somewhere that the unconscious is structured like a language. Or you might say from a Jungian point of view, the collective unconscious, the archetypes and so forth, are a kind of internalization of culture within us. And that's why I just began, very briefly, to indicate in what sort of way I was going to try to picture this internalization of culture, the way society, so to say, inscribes itself on our psyches. And, and that's why, uh, in Jungian thought, there are such powerful residues of the history of religion and of culture in our psyches. Now, I'm trying to just give the very briefest beginnings, really, of, of a theory I want to develop about how that happens. Um, and that will, uh, that will, so to say, bridge the gap between Jungian psychologism and, and the history of religion. Um, but the interesting problems here, I think, for the, what you might call the adjournment of Jungian thought. But let me ask you whether the, these, uh, the, uh, the theory of signs and, uh, and modern French thought uh, has, has uh, influenced you and whether you've encountered it already. <laughs> well, and this is one of the paradoxes, yes. If, if you say that reality is constructed within language, then everything becomes intralinguistic. Um, at the same time, I also want to say, I want to produce some sort of theory of, so to say, language as an expression of the body. So there is a paradox there. Yes. The yes. trouble is that, that's right, when you make the linguistic turn, and you seek to explain language in terms of itself and everything in a linguistic way, you're constantly running into paradoxes. What you're saying somehow makes nonsense applied to itself, and, and it's very difficult to get it right. And I agree there's an antinomy here. On the one hand, um, I want, so to say, to explain language as arising from the differentiation of our feelings and their ordering on various value scales and so on. Um, on the other hand, I want to say that any such theory is constructed within language and can't be foundational in quite the old way. I mean, there's a very acute and unsolved philosophical puzzles here. I, I, I agree. Um, that the body and the self are constructed within language is, is said by Lacan, of course, um, where essentially selfhood is skill in using the personal pronouns. In effect, a baby gets a self by learning to get the I and the me and the you and the he and the she right, as it were. Um, when you can use the pronouns, and in particular, when you've grasped the way the shifters move about, that's the pronouns, the I and you, the first and second person pronouns, which uh, change their reference every time a new person uses them. When you've grasped that, then you've got a set of subjects, you see. Um, there's a set of language users. When you've learnt that for me to say I uh, is different from you to say I, and, and the I and the me change meaning when you and I are conversing, um, then you've understood that there is a plurality of communicating subjects. There's a communications network, as it were. And uh, so for the Lacanians, the self emerges within language and with language, and there is no proper self for um, without language. We have to teach children language to give them a human type of selfhood. Um, on the other hand, the Lacanians themselves want to give a sort of psychoanalytical interpretation of language. <laughs> uh, uh, all language is, is symbolic. Its relation to the, uh, to the psyche is roughly manifested. Like, you know. 
um, language both for presses and reveals and so on. Um, <laughs> and <coughs> so they're caught in the same bind, and, and, and I've got to try to, to resolve that paradox. It, it certainly is, is very difficult, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's omnipresent in thought at the moment, the, the problem of reflexive paradoxes. Um, Names itself, linguistics and language is the tongue. That's right. Yes, yes, that's right. There's reference to the tongue. Yes, 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 and um, that's right. Language, so to say, sets up a world outside language. On the one hand, it seems a sort of tautology that, let us say, physics exists only within language. But all our, all our knowledge systems are obviously, so to say, cultural products, like art products. Uh, on the other hand, they they refer to, and we, so to say, seek to connect them up to a world that's beyond them. And uh, uh, so there, there's a real puzzle. If we're dissatisfied with the sort of uh, notion that there's two worlds, a material world and a thought world, and the thought world tries to copy the material world, if we don't like that old model, we've got to find a new way of, of, uh, of representing it, a new conception of truth yeah. to replace the old correspondence theory. Uh, and that's, that's going to be tough. Something, as it were, matter itself pointed towards or aping of matter to allow the possibility <coughs> of a refinement of science from growing this body as possible yeah. Yeah. into the, the much subtler yes. and uh, more spiritual level. Yes. yes, it looks as if language develops by laying one level of metaphor on top of another, and they build up and up and up, and the lowest level of metaphors have become kind of literal truths. This is the thing Jung, uh, that Nietzsche first said, but I think it, it comes to the <coughs> thing as well, that um, culture is a, is a coral reef of metaphors, of which the lower level ones, having died, are now taken to literal truths. <laughs> but the leading edge of thought in any subject, you're, um, you've got a kind of flux of, of conflicting theories and metaphors, and, and as a metaphor becomes dominant and holds the field, so a big bang or something, um, then I, other thought starts getting organised and, and things start getting problems start getting seen in terms of the dominant metaphor, and you have uh, um, a normal science. Um, as nowadays, for over a hundred years, the uh, Darwinian theory has provided the dominant set of metaphors around which we organise our biology. But uh, that's that's right. Um, which, in fact, mm. you are modifying with that image, because behavior is modifying structure. Mm. Yeah. Use this image of the yes. <laughs> well, there you've got the endless sort of metaphor in a way, and our modern awareness of the history of science as itself being a history of dominant metaphors that hold the situation stable for maybe centuries, and then a period of upheaval and uncertainty, and a new dominant metaphor takes over um, uh, after a scientific revolution. Uh, but you need metaphors to describe these changes, as when I compared a word in a, the dictionary with a gene um, in a human cell, <laughs> you know, on the chromosomes. Um, and the way in which the analogy between the way a word gets its meaning from its place in the whole system, the way it influences the system, and the, the way a gene functions as part of a whole genotype. Yeah. Yes. In the lowest system. Yes. 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 Following Roderick's point about linguistics meaning the tongue, and thinking that yeah. originally all language probably 
they must arise from um, something physical, very physical within the body, so that um, it's mm. a certain picture that might get yes. fixed yes. rather than yes. Yes. rather than the very low. Because when you talk about all language being out of a dictionary. Um, no, I, 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 yes. I, I, I use the dictionary to make the point that words are a very complex, interrelated, differential system, and the meaning of a word is always its, the position it's managing to hold on the we field. Say it all, it all arrives, the dictionary is really the body. Yeah, um, yes, yes, that's right. The, the, the business about you know, words being written on the body, like tattoos and things like that, mm -hmm. um, which... Uh, Nietzsche and a number of thinkers since have, have, have emphasized. Notice, I'll teach him a lesson, meaning I will punish or inflict pain upon <laughs> someone. You know, to teach a child a lesson was to beat it. And very often there was a kind of quite literal printing upon the body. Uh, a very simple example is the way in which a society taught its value scale through the gradations of punishments in the penal code. The very oldest penal codes we've got in the Old Testament, or much further back, the Code of Hammurabi or something, punishments are always very strongly graduated, so they teach a scale. Uh, oh, think of another example, the scale of musical notes, and the way in which we tend to perceive uh, the lower notes as more masculine, the higher more feminine, and so on. And I would say, again, it's through, so to say, the effect of music upon our emotions that we're able to, uh, to, to place the note we've heard on a scale, uh, to describe its, its volume and its uh, tone, uh, and, of course, uh, rhythm and, and so on in music. Uh, I think what happens is that culture refines and differentiates our, our feelings, orders them in scales. Um, a meaning, then, is a place on the scale. Let me give a simple example of this. Um, orange, the colour orange, actually entered Western languages only quite recently. Um, and in most languages, it's the same word as the word for the fruit. In German, there isn't a word for colour orange at all. You just say orange fruit, as it were. Orange is quite a new arrival. Before then, you went straight from the yellow of marigolds to the red of foxes, as it were, and there wasn't a region called orange in between. So when orange arrived, it, so to say, had to push back the neighbouring colours a bit in order to hold a place for itself. Um, and, of course, in our ad advanced society, we've got phenomenal colour perception, and we can now, I think, if you've got a proper chart with frequency versus luminosity, you print all the colours on it, it's been done. You can ask people to write in where they think uh, brick red, fox, flame, marigold, all these amazingly fine nuances belong, and there's a fair amount of agreement. They can draw a little area around the bit they've assigned to that word. Um, but again, I think it's, it's a matter, so to say, of our feelings. Uh, it's feeling that becomes meaning. And that's why I use this phrase, the expression of the body is the cognition of the world. Um, that the inner and the outer really do belong together. Our ability to order our world and, and assign meaning to it is correlated with, so to say, the um, differentiation and, and refinement and ordering of our feeling responses. That's the, I think, the point you, you raised earlier. I, I'm just yeah. groping for a, a, a theory of language here. Um, it's, as, it's as if there are... Yeah. It, I mean, a, a, it, it's easily thought. Mm. Language mm. belongs to consciousness. Yeah. But, uh, I'm trying to root it further back to the it, body it and expression. From yes. Yes. And as if there are yes. slots wait, ready and waiting for the appropriate sound to be heard, which fits yes. into that slot and then becomes. That's right. And people, of course, nowadays try to teach computers how to recognize language, use rather similar ideas yes. of scales and grids. A computer science friend helped me with this. And I also got from a line from Derrida and one from Nietzsche that helped me in, in this suggestion that I want now to try to work out. Yes. Um, there's been quite an interesting ma recent American book, which, which you may like, called The Body's Recollection of Being. Um, now, that book argues that Western thought has run into nihilism um, because we have too much divorced thought from the body. Uh, he goes to the writer's point of view, um, goes particularly to dance and expressive gesture. Uh, 
um, as the first forms of communication. But, uh, he again is trying to um, renew our sense of reality and overcome the, the uh, rather pervasive pessimism and nihilist culture by seeking the roots of meaning in the body. Um, yeah, that may be right. And uh, I mean, what particularly attracts me is, along this sort of lines I indicated, of bridging the gap between expressivism, which it seems purely subjective, so to say, and cognition, which seems purely disembodied. That you might be able to bring the two together and, and, uh, and, and solve an ancient divorce in Western thought, which has done a lot of harm. Um, hmm. so, it's just merely an illustration going back to your interesting point about the last range of colours that we hmm. sort of perceive and identify. Remember George Mackay <coughs> Brown speaking hmm. of Orkney, saying that in the old dialect there were five different words for rain, which um, you, knew, when you used it, you accept. What kind of whether it was heavy rain, whether it was pelting down, whether it was a nice, gentle, soft drizzle. Mm. And that was related immediately, of course, to the physical experience of living yeah. outside as a fisherman or as a um, shepherd. And yes. you needed yes. um, this in your language. And he, he speaks, of course, to the threat of <laughs> our losing yes. this sort of thing. And yet we. I did suddenly struck what you were saying, that um, we, we develop it in other ways. This yes. is part of the way in which experience, I language just, changes with experience. We've got very much better, of course, at chemically synthesizing a huge range of colors. So if you think of medieval stained glass, the colors they could actually make a rather limited range of six or eight principal ones. Or, uh, um, whereas if you go into a modern chemist's and look at the display of lipstick or something, you'll find 70 or 80 reds discriminated, as it were, a much wider range, I think, than was available in the past. Possibly aniline dyes and so on have made it possible for us to develop very, very wide range of colours. Well, yeah, but you could get... Been around for a long time, Sorry? Oranges as a fruit have been Yes. Why is it that we suddenly have a word for it where we didn't before? I mean, it well, like I think uh, precisely because we haven't been able to do it before. Well, I think perceptions... Well, I think perceptions have been refined. In traditional societies, they got highly refined in areas that were very important like the rain in the Orkneys, or the cattle of the Dinka. The Dinka have got 80 words for different patterns of colours on cattle, because they're potty about cattle and care little about anything else. <laughs> or Chaucer, Chaucer the, Eskimo, the Eskimos have only black, white and red uh, for their ordinary colours, but a phenomenal vocabulary for um, snow and ice, different types of snow and ice. So I think in traditional societies you, you got a very enriched discrimination in areas that were important to your survival. Um, I think in, in the modern West we've uh, perhaps we're very we're becoming we've become highly visual, um, very highly visual. Uh, Western culture is, you know, Greek culture is visual, but we've become very much uh, more so in, in modern times. Uh, I've worked with a BBC cameraman, uh, with somebody who's really visual, and the sensitivity is phenomenal. Um, and we, and we synthesize a very wide range of colors. We've got a very long tradition of painting that is very important to us, and, and cinema and so on. Um, I suppose uh, that particular case of, of the reds is because red is uh, the most emotionally charged color. It's the color of sex and danger and blood and so on. It's a symbolically highly important color in almost all societies. And we can, we can sort of say, differentiate our feelings in that area. Um, further, because because it, uh, with our modern technologies, and we and we do now perceive a quite extraordinary range of reds. Um, on the other hand, it's also happened with greens. You see, that um, after Bonnard, after the impressionists showed us what an amazing range of greens there are in a well-stocked garden, <laughs> we now see um, an astonishing range, quite readily, which you won't find, I think, in painting before the 19th century. Um, mm. Have you got any further thoughts on that? Um, I think it's true. I, I, I just said that another sort of yeah. nice illustration um, yeah. you know that Chaucer mm. um, gives all his pilgrims are riding to um, Canterbury. Mm. He has a different name, one for their horse. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's interesting. Yes. 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 And as swords also had names. Yes. And so on. Yes. Yes. Where the guns don't. Um, yes. That's right. Um, 
And kinship, of course, was very much more richly perceived in the past than it yes. is now. You knew your fourth and fifth cousins in the Middle Ages. Nowadays, in our highly mobile bourgeois society, many people never meet their first cousins. Mm. You know. So we've yeah. lost on kinship. We've gained on perception of the, of, uh, so to say, the fine detail of our, of our visual world. Yes. Um, Dutch flower paintings, I think, are the very first ones where you get butterflies, beetles, snails and things painted so meticulously that you can still tell what species it is today, straight off. Um, uh, that's, that's really since the 17th century, that, that very uh, fine-grained perception has developed. Mm, I, uh, yeah. Well, I think you've been talking something yeah. about people starting rather... Well, you wouldn't say 12th century, the Southern Minster and so on, the leaves and so on. Yes, yes. yes uh, Southern, uh, the leaves of Southern and so on, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's there, yes, it's certainly there at Southern, because you can... It's clear what species of leaf it is on this capital at Southern. You can tell whether it's oak or holly or whatever, yes. Yes. Sorry, something... Yes, I think what's actually relates very much to the question you were asking us about, mm. uh, whether In language, so... Yes. Mm. Peirce had three, icon, index, and sign, um, that's right, uh, but, uh, but it does get more differentiated in uh, the, the number of different words. Um, but uh, wasn't it the case from the beginning that in, in Jungian analysis uh, you were engaged in a kind of interpretative conversation and there was, there was less idea of, so to say, producing the final truth like a rabbit out of a hat. Rather, in Jungian analysis, a kind of interpretative conversation through which one gradually comes to understanding meaning one's own life uh, goes on. And it's not so much that treatment stops, but rather you reach a point when the patient can do it for himself or herself. Is that right? But the Jungian doesn't, so to say, produce an answer in the same sort of way that some, at any rate, dogmatic Freudians claim they could. So Sewer himself did believe in the signified, so to say. He said the signified and the signified, the, uh, so to say, the mark and its meaning, were as close to each other as the two sides of a sheet of paper. But nevertheless, he did distinguish them. Whereas um, Derrida rejects the idea of a signified altogether and uh, believes only in the signifier, as it were, the mark. And he'll say, when you look at the dictionary, you find one sort of grammar, uh, mark uh, correlated with others. <laughs> you never find the meaning in the dictionary, all you find is other, other signifiers. <laughs> um, and it, well, maybe that's a, a, a rather high flown dispute. But uh, it does, yes, it certainly struck me thinking about this that uh, many things in this recent French thought should be highly congenial to Jungians and would. Uh, um, suggest ways in which uh, the tradition can develop. There's something I'd just like to say to them. Mm. One of uh, Jung's metaphors for the analytic process as he saw it as mm. being transformative was of two elements or two atoms coming into proximity and having, as it were, metaphorically by the, the very shape and charge of each self having an effect upon each other, mm. which yes. a variety of different sorts of mm. effect, but really in the course of which transformation takes place. And although language is essential in that, a lot of it is below work. Mm. And in fact, in my experience, a lot of the most transformative parts are below work. Yes. Yes, but uh, there might still be language-like processes going on in us of which we're not conscious. Oh yes, 
And indeed, this does seem to happen every night when one goes to sleep thinking about something and has new ideas about it in the morning. This would suggest <laughs> that language like processes go on inside us in all sorts of ways in which you're unaware. Or rather, as you can know that you have got something filed away in your memory, even though you can't at the moment produce it. Now again, th this must be a language-like operation or storage system, which is outside consciousness. Indeed, but there are also, when I say that it's language but below a word, I mean yeah. there are the smells of sweat yes. and there is a host of oh, things yes. that is taking place between those subjects. And there are kind of identic imagery you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, for example, if I say breakfast, you might hear the tinkle of the spoon in the cornflake bowl or the smell of frying bacon or something, where um, uh, identic imagery is functioning as kind of symbolism. Is that the kind of thing you think of that, that there's a sort of... Well, I was meaning more... Language of memories and images and things uh, going on in us. I was meaning more that, mm. that you, can, you can smell someone's yeah. sweat, you can I smell know. the different... Uh, you can smell a sweat of rage or a fear. Ah, yes. And that you can feel without being able to determine exactly what language it is you're picking up. Yes. But you can feel that yes. it comes into the world yes. really angry. Yes. Very unhappy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes.